Hey everyone, welcome to Crosswinds Church where we're all about the vision of growing closer to Jesus and going to our worlds. No matter who you are or where you're joining us from, there is a place for you here. If you'd like to attend one of our services, you can go to cwcmv.org forward slash sermons to check out the times, upcoming, as well as previous sermons. Thank you so much for joining us. We hope you enjoy the service. guys were at the gym and they were uh, in the locker room cleaning up and as they're doing that the phone rings the phone's sitting on the bench and so one guy goes over and obviously he hits the the uh, speaker phone on the phone and a gal on the phone says sweetheart is that you and he says yes she says, well, I'm glad I caught you. She says, I'm at the mall, and, and I, I see this coat, and it is just a beautiful coat. It, it accentuates my figure and everything, and, and the only thing is, it costs $1,000. And the guy says, well, sweetheart, for you, nothing is ever too expensive. So if, if, it, if it's something you want, then you can have that. And she says, oh, thank you. Have I ever told you that you are the perfect husband? And he says, well, oh, thank you. And she says, oh, by the way, uh, uh, on the way home, I was going to stop by the Mercedes dealer because I think they have those new SLs in that we've been looking at. She says, I think they're about 95000 And he says, well, sweetheart, if that's what you want, you know, that, that's what you will have. Just make sure we get all the accessories, all the, all the options better come for that price. And she says, oh, you're just, you're just so wonderful to me. You're so good to me. I love you so much. Yes, I, I love you too. And she says, oh, one more thing. The realtor called, and he, uh, he, he said that uh, the house that we've been looking at is back up on the market. Uh, it, it's, it's listed for $950,000. So uh, what, what do you think of that? He says, well, go ahead and offer them $900,000, and, and we'll see where that goes. She says, oh, thank you, sweetheart. You are the perfect husband. And he says, well, you know, you're, you're the perfect wife. So, you know, goodbye. I love you. Click, and off she goes. And he looks at his friends, and they're all looking at him like, <laughs> and he says, well, does uh, anybody know whose phone this is? <laughs> We're not quite as perfect sometimes as we appear. If you have your Bibles, turn to the book of 1 Timothy. We're going to pick up in chapter 3 where we left off last time. And Paul has been talking about various aspects of the church. Uh, we've looked at, at different aspects as we are talking here about building this church in the 21st century. And now he turns to the leadership of the church, a vital, important part of any organization. And he says in verse 1, it is a trustworthy statement, if any man aspires to the office of overseer, it's a fine work that he desires to do. Now, an overseer would be like an elder or a pastor or really in any sense, uh, any kind of leader. It was a common term uh, back when Paul wrote this if it, for anyone who had oversight or leadership over anyone else. Now, I can hear some of you right now, you might be saying, well, that's not me. I, I desire a lot of things, but I do not desire to be an overseer. I do not desire to be a leader. So therefore, the message today doesn't really relate to me all that much. Well, yeah, you can say that, but you'd be wrong because, of course, all Scripture is profitable for all of us, and I believe this morning we're all going to be challenged a bit with what Paul has to say concerning leadership. It's interesting that in this passage, he's not talking about what leaders should do. Rather, he's more concerned with who they are. What are their character qualities? And so this morning, as we've been talking about building the church, we're going to expand that now and actually talk about how to build the perfect church. Wouldn't that be awesome? We'll just be the perfect church. And we see that in this passage today. And, and in fact, not only do we see it, we see it in three steps. There's three easy steps. Well, there's three steps. 
to being that perfect church. Here's the first step. Step one, find some perfect overseers. Why do you laugh? Okay, <laughs> I guess you're not going to stop. Uh, uh, verse two begins this way. An overseer then must be above reproach. Now, that's a great start because that really sets the tone for everything else that's going to follow, every characteristic. This is a, this is a, the, it, it's a summary, if you will, of his character, which should be blameless. He should have a good reputation. And again, leaders, we set the tone for other people. So the rest of the characteristics he's going to give in this list, don't you love lists in Scripture, lists like the Ten Commandments? or the fruit of the Spirit? Don't they make you feel so good because you're doing so good with those lists? Well, today is going to be no exception. He says here, in, it continues in verse 2. Here's the beginning of the list. He should be the husband of one wife. Literally, this is a one-woman man. Now, there's different interpretations of what that means in terms of uh, whether he can be divorced or all that. I'm not, I don't have time this morning to get into all that. But one thing I will say is this was a very, uh, a characteristic that was very counter to the culture of that day. There weren't a lot of one-woman men. I've talked before about the temple prostitutes that, that uh, uh, worked there in the temple of Artemis in the city of Ephesus. The Greek culture, in fact, I read this, this this week, the Greek culture actually held that every man should have actually three women in his life, a mistress for conversation, a concubine for pleasure, and a wife to bear his children. Well, Paul says, uh-uh, that ain't the way it's going to be in the church. You're going to be a one-woman man. You're going to find this amazing superwoman, and I have, that can fulfill all of those, those, those jobs. He goes on. They are to be temperate, balanced, not extreme or excessive. He has his priorities right. God first, then family, then his church responsibilities. He is to be prudent. In other words, he's to have sound and balanced judgment. He's to be practical. He's to have wisdom that's born out of experience. He's to be respectable. Now, here we're talking about dignified behavior, someone that society looks up to in the way they carry themselves, the language they use. In, he, it says next, he was to be hospitable. Now, in Middle, Middle Eastern culture, hospitality is vitally important. We have missionaries that uh, minister in Middle Eastern cultures, and they tell me that, that the, the biggest part, a big part of their ministry is just having people over and, and enjoying meals together and, and, uh, and visiting and fellowshipping together. And so believers, as believers, we are commanded to be hospitable. And, so, uh, and in doing so, we are then an example to those around us. We are to be able to teach. This comes about as close to a job description as you can get, but the emphasis here is on ability. The, churches, the church leaders shouldn't be called, for instance, because they're popular or because they put in their time, you know, so-and-so's been here a long time. It's about time we made him an elder. No, the, we, we need to follow these, these characteristics. And what he's talking about here, really, instead of, you know, we're not saying that all the elders are going to get up and preach. It's, that it's really their ability to handle the truth. Can they correctly interpret what the Bible says and then apply it to life? And that doesn't mean just in teaching a class or in, uh, in preaching a message. In fact, 1 Timothy 2.2 talks about all of us. The things which you have heard from me in the presence of many witnesses, entrust these to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. Those aren't just sermons or Sunday school classes. He gives a few examples of what these people should not be. They should not be addicted to wine. This one is obvious. Ephesians 5, uh, 18 says, do not get drunk on wine, which leads to dissipation. The Bible doesn't prohibit drinking, but it does prohibit drunkenness. I like this next one. In, in the NAS, it's not pugnacious. <laughs> not pugnacious, but gentle. And you say, what's pugnacious? A pugnacious person is a person who's violent. Uh, but, you know, you often think of boxers as being pugnacious, okay? And so a violent person, a bully, if you will, a violent person is an abusive person, and it takes many forms. There's physical abuse, mental abuse, social abuse. It comes really from a, out of a deep disrespect for other people. And so we need to check people out to make sure they don't have some of these things. He says they need to be peaceable. They need to, have, uh, need to not have a, an argumentative personality so that they're not people who are defensive or insecure. And why do I say that? Because 
oftentimes the reason people are, uh, are, 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 uh, tear others down is because they're insecure about themselves. There's a couple of ways you can, you can increase your stature. You know, you can do it the right way, which is to learn more and, and, and actually get better, become a better person, you know, a better example, or you could tear the people down around you. And there are plenty of people that do that. You probably know some. And in doing that, you at least feel like you're better than them because you've lowered them, in fact. He is to be free from the love of money. Making money, obviously, shouldn't be the reason that you want to be in, 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 a, in religion or in, in the church. He must be one who manages his own household well. Now, I don't happen to believe that it's a requirement that he be married. Some do, but I don't happen to be one of those. Uh, but if he does, and if he is married, if he has a family, then he should manage that family well. The word here, manage, not rule. It means to, to govern your family compassionately. You lead them. You, you direct them. You're not overly stern or cruel or tyrannical. He goes on, keeping his children under control with all dignity. In other words, his children respect him enough to submit to him and to do what he says. Then Paul gives a reason for this, this last particular qualification in verse 5. He says, but if a man does not know how to manage his own household, how will he take care of the church of God? If your marriage is on the rocks, if your kids are out of control, why in the world should I listen to you? That is not a good leader. Verse 6, and not a new convert, so that he will not become conceited and fall into the condemnation incurred by the devil. We've, we've had times where famous people, you know, football players or other athletes, or I remember Larry Flint many, many years ago, uh, uh, the leader of a, a porn magazine, they come to know Jesus Christ, and it's almost like the next weekend they have them in somebody's pulpit preaching, you know, telling their story. You shouldn't be doing that. Those are not the, we, we haven't tested them. They, they, they're not, they shouldn't be new converts. Leadership, leaders need to be mature in their faith. I, I, I've looked back, I have uh, files in my office, real files, not electric files. I mean, files in file, uh, file folders in a cabinet. And I look back at stuff that I did 30, 40 years ago in the church, and I'm like, whoa, I said that? I did that? You know, I, I've matured. I'm not who I was back then. New converts can do a lot of things really good. I mean, they can excite your church. They can give us a, a, a feeling of vibrancy. And, and, you know, I love, I love those of you that are new to the faith. I love having you around. You remind us what it should be like to be a follower of Jesus Christ. But new converts are not good leaders yet. They hopefully will be at some point. It's interesting when he says here, don't put them in positions of authority so they don't become conceited. That word literally means to be wrapped in smoke. In other words, they, in other words, they are so prideful that they don't see themselves clearly. Or as I have occasion to say, some young people uh, are confident, are absolutely confident of something they know nothing about. <laughs> and he talks about not being that way so that you don't come uh, up with the condemnation incurred by the devil. What is that all about? Well, in Isaiah 14, we see the devil standing up to the Lord saying, I will make myself like the most high. He was not seeing it. So talk about somebody being wrapped in smoke. And what happened? He fell. And of course, that's not something we want to see a leader going through. Verse 7, he must have a good reputation with those outside the church so that he will not fall into reproach and the snare of the devil. They need to be good neighbors, good citizens, good friends to those on the outside. It's one of the reasons we have these cards. We're praying for those people, those people in your world, and I hope you have one. And if you don't, grab one on the way out. They're self-explanatory about what it's all about. But leaders uh, ought to be first in line for these, and we should be praying for our world and, and investing in their lives. And sometimes that means, you know, interacting with your neighbors or, you know, keeping your lawn mowed and things like that. So that's step one. To becoming the perfect church, you find some perfect overseers that fulfill every one of those uh, qualifications every time, all the time. That's step one. Now step two, we're going to add some perfect deacons. A deacon literally is one who serves. The word is used quite often in Scripture for people who are serving, uh, even Jesus at some times. But there is actually a position, it would seem, in Acts chapter 6 where there were some women, some widows who were not being well cared for. 
And so they went to the apostles, the overseers in that situation, and they said, we got to take, you guys got to take care of these women. The apostles said, well, we are busy with the spiritual stuff. You know, we got to be in the word and, and, and teach and preach. And so you need to choose out some people to take care of that job. And those people were uh, the first deacons. And so deacons have a tendency to be those people that are in charge, <coughs> they're in charge of physical things, like the, uh, the in, around here at our church, it's the, <coughs> sorry, <coughs> I just inhaled something. <laughs> I hope it didn't fly in. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, here we go. Uh, so where were we? Oh, yes. So around here, they're in charge of finances and facilities, and, the, and we have deacons uh, in order to enable the elders to be uh, about the spiritual aspects of the church and praying for the body and, and ministering to them in those ways. Now, a deacon still needs to be a spiritual man. It's a huge responsibility, not the least of which is they tend to often handle a lot of money because if you're handling the facilities, that's a huge part of what we do around here. And so many of the qualities that we see for deacons also are the same as what we've seen for overseers. Look at verse 8. Deacons, likewise, meaning in the same way, must be men of dignity. In other words, men that are worthy of respect, that have obvious good character. He goes on, not double-tongued or addicted to much wine or fond of sordid gain. It's interesting that that's a great word picture, double-tongued. What does that mean? That means that you don't say something to one person and then say the opposite to somebody else, okay? You're a person with integrity. You, you're a person that can be trusted. You're not deceptive. Verse 9, but holding to the mystery of the faith with a clear conscience. In other words, these need to be men of spiritual death. The mystery of the faith. Remember, we've talked about this before. When something is a mystery in Scripture, it means that it was something that was not understood or revealed in the past, but now it has been revealed, and I can just tell you what he's talking about here is the plan of salvation. What Jesus Christ has done for us was a mystery in the past, in the Old Testament. They were looking forward to it, but it was still a mystery as to how it was going to be done. And then in the New Testament, it has now been revealed to us so that we can preach the full gospel today. But these men are not just believers. They, they demonstrate the gospel that, that it has taken root in their lives. Verse 10, these men also first must be tested. Let them serve as deacons if they are beyond reproach. So we're not talking about a deacon test here. It's not a formal test. In other words, what you're doing is you're watching them. You're observing them. You're looking for their spiritual qualities. One of the reasons is because with what deacons do, it's tempting just to find somebody that's really good at that. I mean, you find a guy who's an accountant, a professional, a CPA. Put them in charge of your finances because they know money. And yet it's not enough just to know money. You've got to know the Lord and you've got to be a man of, of good character. It'd be tempting to get somebody to run the, uh, the facilities and the, and the church plant, you know, get, them, get somebody that's out of the construction field or something. But the most important, and it's great if you can, as long as they spiritually qualify, as he says here. In verse 11, he begins talking about women. And I'll just say that the word translated here, woman, could mean woman or wife. And so different people have either taken this to mean the wives of the deacons, is who he's talking about now, or the women that were actually deacons. I happen to believe the latter. I believe these are women that are serving as deacons. Whichever case, whichever way you go, these are prominent women in the church. And Paul expects their behavior to be as above reproach as the males. Look at verse 11. Women must likewise be dignified, not malicious gossips, but temperate, faithful in all things. These women are those that you can count on to fulfill their duties. And I can tell you, we've got plenty of them around here at Crosswinds Church. I, 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 plenty of women around here that I know that if I say do this and they say they will, I know it's going to be done. I don't have to think about it anymore. In fact, I can even go as far as saying we couldn't do church the way we do it without the women who are involved in leadership and ministry here. Amen? <laughs> Amen, guys, especially. So there's the women. He's right back to the men now with the qualities we saw as the overseers. Let me just read this because you, you've heard these before. Verse 12, deacons must be husbands of only one wife, good managers of their children and of their households. For those who have served well as deacons, they obtain for themselves a high standing and a great confidence in the faith that is in Christ Jesus. So there you go. Step one to building the perfect church. All you got to do is find some perfect overseers. And then you go out and find some perfect deacons. And then the third part, 
lest you get left out, we all become perfect members. Look at verse 14. I am writing these things to you, hoping to come to you before long, but in case I am delayed, I write so that you will know how one ought to conduct himself in the household of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and the support of the truth. Now, I've shared before, but you may not remember, it's been a few weeks, but verse 15 is actually the theme of the entire book of 1 Timothy. That's why he wrote it for us. And so in this, he's he's reminding us that the church of God is not this building. I mean, this building is a church, but the church he's talking about, it's us. It's the people of God. Like I said last week in, uh, in 1 Peter, we are living stones being built up as a spiritual house. And so it's an important distinction here to realize when he says here, for instance, that we are the pillar and the support, meaning we are the foundation of the truth. It, we aren't the truth, you know, but we support the truth. We are here uh, as and the truth is uh, the main thing that we deal with. Of course, the truth comes from God himself. So there you go. There's the perfect church. Find some perfect overseers and add some perfect deacons and become a perfect member. Now, you look at that, and you look at these lists, and you might be wondering, like I do, how in the world could I ever do this? I mean, there there are times when I do these, but there are also times when I don't do these. And and, and Scripture does say, Jesus himself said, if you have broken the law in one place, you've broken the entire thing. And so sometimes, you know, I am far off. All all goes to say, in my own abilities and, and what I see here and look at my life, I am not perfect. Well, fortunately, Paul finishes with one more verse, verse 16. And look what he says. By common confession, meaning we all agree, we all agree, great is the mystery of godliness. We agree that this mystery of godliness, again, that, that this, this mystery of godliness, this, this secret, if you will, of being godly, that was a mystery before, but now it's been revealed. It's been hidden, but now it has been revealed in Jesus Christ. This is probably what he finishes up with, this chapter, is probably the words to a hymn that they sang at that time. And what it is, is a summary of the gospel, and it's all about Jesus. Look what it says here. For he who was revealed in the flesh, God became a man, Jesus Christ, was vindicated in the spirit. In other words, Jesus did miracles through the power of the spirit within him, ultimately even being raised from the dead. He was seen by angels. Angels constantly are glorifying and exalting Jesus, and especially now that he has completed the work that he was sent to do. He is proclaimed among the nations. That's the Great Commission. That's what Gil and Amy are all about. That's what all of us are all about as we go to our worlds to make disciples. Believed on in the world. That's hopefully the result of the Great Commission. And then taken up in glory, the ascension of Jesus Christ with the confidence, the knowledge that he is going to return again. Guys, this list that we have here, they are daunting. For me as a leader, for for those who would be deacons, for all of us as we strive to accomplish everything on it. But I hope that this list serves what I think is the purpose that it's there. Much like the law. Why do we have the law? The law is there, according to the Apostle Paul, in order to show us that we cannot keep the law. Any of you guys lied lately? Any of you guys ever, you know, uh, and I mean guys, guys, that was anybody, men or women, but any, any, anybody looked on somebody else with lust? And, you know, I mean, we, we all have to realize that as you look down the Ten Commandments, I have broken all of them. Well, I would hope that as we look at this list, and I think it's one of the reasons for it, that we realize I cannot do this. I I don't qualify as an overseer in this church. And because of that, it drives me to my knees. Guys, every other religion out there will tell you, this is what you need to do do, to uh, uh, to be accepted by God. You need to do this. You need to do this. You need to act this way. You need to dress like this. You need to eat this food. You need to do all this stuff. All right, good luck. (laughs) That's about all they got for you. But guys, great is the mystery. Because you see, God came and dwelled in this world in the person of Jesus Christ. And then even better, he died for us and paid the price for our sin. Because the Bible said, all of us have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, short of perfection. Amen? Can we not all agree with that? I don't really have to expand on that, right? 
But however, but Jesus Christ came and he died on a cross in our place. He died the death because scripture says the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. He sinned not, and yet he died only for us. And then all that's left for us is to choose to follow him, to make that that choice to go after him. And then once that happens, Scripture tells us that his spirit then comes and lives within us. And that's what gives us the power to fulfill these lists. Guys, that's how we become perfect without even quotation marks around it. Next to our salvation, guys, I would submit to you that this is the greatest truth in all of Scripture, that we can be filled with the Spirit. I can be empowered to do exactly what he has called me to do. And in Christ, I can do it perfectly. Amen? We all have that. Ephesians 5.18, one of my favorite verses. Do not get drunk with wine. It's not a temperance verse, by the way. Do not get drunk with wine, for that is dissipation, but be filled with the Spirit. Why does he say it like that? If you're like me, you've had experience with people that are drunk with wine. They don't act normal, do they? They don't act like themselves. They're totally different. What are they acting like? They're acting like whatever the wine is doing to them. The wine is controlling them. The wine is empowering them to say and do the things that they're doing. Paul brings it up here because he said, that's what being filled with the Spirit is like. It's allowing the Spirit of God to control you and to empower you. And it's interesting that it's not a one-time thing. Now, receiving the Spirit, when you, when you come to know Jesus Christ, you are baptized in the Spirit, and He's in your life, and He's never leaving. But the filling of the Spirit is a choice that we have to make day by day and most of us moment by moment. I have to say, Lord Jesus, you know, fill me with your Spirit. So rather than going back to this list and saying, okay, I got to be respectable, I got to be godly, I got to be this, or I'm not a good overseer. No, I don't have to do all of that. I have to say, Lord, fill me with your Spirit. Whatever you've called me to do, Lord, that's what I want to do. Now fill me with your Spirit so that I am able to do it. And not only that, but we have the fruit of the Spirit, which results from that in Galatians 5. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, self-control, faithfulness, all of those things. I'm not naturally about half of those, guys. It's only through the power of the Son. When you see me being impatient, right at that moment, I am not filled with the Spirit. I need to stop, and I don't need to pray for patience. I need to pray, Lord, fill me with your Spirit. Because once the Spirit is in me, I'm going to be patient because that's the fruit. Or as I like to say, it ain't the fertilizer, it's the fruit. (laughs) Acting patient doesn't make me spiritual. (laughs) It's being filled with the Spirit and then demonstrating that through my patience that isn't there naturally for me. Guys, I am not the perfect husband. Even if, even if I buy my wife a $95,000 roadster, I am not the perfect husband. But guess what? You ask my wife, and she'll tell you, I am perfect when I'm walking in the Spirit. Now, she loves me, and she's gracious, and she'll say I'm perfect all the time, but she knows better. She's not going to air dirty laundry out in front of everybody. <laughs> but when I'm walking in the Spirit, and I, and I say the same for her, we are perfect. Marriage is awesome at that time. And so that's the challenge that Paul gives us today. Let me give you a couple of takeaways, and then we'll have the worship team up. First off, you know, we talked right at the very top about the desire to be an overseer. And for most, that's not your desire. That's just, uh, that's even biblical. Most are not leaders. So what is my desire? I'd encourage you to ask yourself that. What fine work do I desire to do? Another one, how do I measure up to these character qualities? Uh, the, uh, again, these are important because they, they give us a standard. They show us what should be there. But even more so, as I said this morning, it's good for us to rehearse them because then I begin to see, okay, I need help in this area. doesn't mean I go out and, um, you know, take classes on how to be more patient. It means I say, Lord Jesus, fill me with your spirit. And then and that leads to the third one. Is the mystery of godliness a reality in my life? Do I walk in the spirit as he wants us to do so? You say, how do you do that? Well, you, you ask for it and he gives it to you. 
And maybe you take control back. You know, you, you allow him to control and empower you, but maybe, you know, you, you get going through the day and you have a rough moment and somebody says something or does something and, and you take control back and you, you get impatient and you get angry and, and you're no longer loving somebody. Well, then you do it again. You say, Lord Jesus, fill me with your spirit. Another way to look at it is ABC. The A is you admit, Lord, I can see by my behavior and, and, and by, the, by the list you've given me of how this is what I should be, but I know I'm not there, Lord, and I admit that to you. And then secondly, believe that Jesus Christ did send his spirit to fill us, to control us, and to empower us, and that he will do that if we ask, and that leads to the C, I choose to ask. I choose to say, Lord, fill me with your spirit. Enable me to do what you've called me to do. I cannot be your pastor. Paul can't be your pastor. None of the leaders, the elders in this church can be your leaders without doing that regularly because in and of ourselves, we are not the kind of people that ought to be your overseers. But through the power of Jesus Christ, we are. And that's not just for leaders. That's for every one of us. Amen? Isn't it great? I love the way God tells us what to do. And, and it seems impossible. But trust me, guys, if he tells us to do something, he will also give us the power to do it. He promises that. And that is an awesome promise. And I pray that we all live in that promise. Let's pray now. Father, thank you for your word to us. Thank you for this challenge. And Lord, I know as we look at lists like this, I, I'm first in line to be one that feels like, man, do I ever not measure up? But I was never meant to measure up. It's Jesus Christ. It's, it's your son living his life through me and the Holy Spirit that measures up. And so, Father, may we catch this, this reality, this vision that is so often neglected in the church today. Most people feel like I've just got to be good today. And yeah, we got to be good. But even more than that, Lord, we got, to in, in, we got to allow you to fill us with your spirit and then realize that the goodness will grow out of that. That will be the fruit. And so, Lord, may we, may we get that. May we understand that. May we live like it. And Lord, as we give our offerings right now, we do so cheerfully because, Father, we want this message to go far and wide from this room. So use these offerings that we give right now to spread your word, your gospel, your hope to this world that is hopeless and in darkness and in sin. And we will give you the glory for all that is accomplished. For we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Here at Crosswinds Church, we believe this vision of growing and going can change your life and the world around you. Crosswinds Church is a nonprofit, which means it operates from gifts given from people just like you. When you give, your money goes to creating opportunities for people to grow and go all over this world. I would love for you to be a part of that. And you can give a gift right now by clicking on the Give button in the top right corner of this page. Or you could go to cwcmv.org forward slash give. Join us in what God is doing through this vision of growing and going and have a great day.